Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Carr and I uh, am with Octo. I serve uh, two roles in Octo. I am a coordinator of the EBM Tools Network and also uh, editor of the Skimron Marine Ecosystems and Management Newsletter. Um, we're so glad everyone can be with us today. Um, today we're going to be getting an overview of the red list of e ecosystems and on it uh, with us today we have Radhika Murthy of IUCN, Marcos Valderabano of IUCN, and David Oboro of Cordio and the IUCN Coral Specialist Group uh, to be talking today about the Red List of Ecosystems. Um, just to give everyone just an overview of how the presentation will be run, um, we'll first um, have a formal presentation from the speakers about the Red List, and then we'll move to interactive question and answers. Um, feel free to send questions in through the Q&A or the chat function um, at any point during the webinar, but we'll hold substantive questions till the end or during the Q&A portion of the, of the presentation. Um, and also, we, um, the, the, you, you, uh, attendees can uh, send chats to the whole uh, audience, but um, we ask that you use this respectfully and only um, uh, send things pertaining to the webinar. So anyway, I'll turn it over to Radhika now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you very much for, for hosting this for us. We were very keen to, um, to link up with this uh, amazing network of experts and, and to share a bit about IECN as well as about the Red List of Ecosystems and, and then uh, working with um, David. Yes, actually, we, we discovered Sarah's uh, audio has a bit of crackle, but the rest of us, it seems fine. So we'll just try and work with that um, instead of losing her altogether. <laughs> so my name is Radhika Murthy, and I'm the director of IUCN's Global Ecosystem Management Program based at the headquarters in Switzerland. And um, as you may be familiar, we, we, our work involves producing very key knowledge products or tools for helping us understand uh, our ecosystems, our species, and then using that information generated to actually um, uh, be able to have informed decisions for conservation. And uh, we're an intergovernmental organization. Uh, we're a mix of governments and non-government membership. So we have about 87 governments that are our members and then are over a thousand uh, non-government uh, um, members, so NGOs, as well as Indigenous Peoples Groups. And um, we have 52 offices around the world. We work very closely across the different realms, uh, biomes, ecosystems. And um, today we really wanted to bring to you uh, some of the basics of RLE, together with uh, um, uh, having David talk about a very concrete example of how the, the tool has been applied in a marine ecosystem. And um, just as you go through the presentation, some of the questions, given we've done this a few times, some of the questions you may have, which I can perhaps just talk a little bit about is, why another assessment tool? There are so many out there. So this is trying to shift from ecosystem assessments to assessing risks of ecosystems. And that too in a very systematic way where we can go back to those risk levels and be able to see the interventions we're making, are they increasing a risk or are they decreasing that risk level? And, and what that risk level uh, that I refer to is, it's very mirrored with the red list of species that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, Marcus is gonna go a bit more into the details um, using the PowerPoint slides. And, and secondly, it's like, here's yet another uh, tool, uh, do we need uh, more data? The, the good thing with RLE is the priority is to use existing data and take all of that and turn it into a risk assessment uh, to be able to understand what are those threats that our ecosystems face, what we can do about it, and how we can measure if we're moving in the right direction. 
And then the, the key really for IUCN is to, to mobilize the world, mobilize experts like you, because with this one consistent approach, we're hoping or we're aiming to have them all add up to global assessments. And, and this underpinned by a new global typology of ecosystems, a new global way of classifying ecosystems that, uh, that Marcus is also briefly going to mention. And using that as the map of the world to start then doing global assessments, which can either be done uh, top down or which can then build on the pieces of assessments done at subnational, national, regional levels. And we hope that these little pieces add up to a bigger sum so we can start accelerating actions around uh, ecosystem level management and conservation. And so far, um, a lot of the assessments have been done on terrestrial ecosystems. So for us, it was really key to reach out to all of you and see if we can work together and do more of assessments on marine ecosystems. And, and here, uh, work, we'll be working really closely with many of you, we hope, after uh, we impress you with our presentation today, but also with the IUCN Global Marine Program. And online, as a participant, we have our director for the marine program, Mina Epps. Um, so we're very keen to get some reactions from you, hear from you, and then really look at how we can concretely engage after this presentation. So welcome. Thank you for making the time. Right now, everybody's flooded with webinars. We really, really appreciate that you've joined us. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass this on to Marcos. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to make a short presentation for about 10 minutes um, with an overview of what the red list of ecosystem is, what potential applications, and then I will leave um, uh, some time for David Obura to present the assessment of the coral reefs of West Indian Ocean that may be a bit more um, familiar or appealing. So I will start with the very basics um, of what red list of ecosystems is. So a red list of ecosystem assessments um, uh, reflects the probability of the ecosystem to collapse. So the first thing um, <clears throat> is defining what collapses, what is the, the, that theoretical threshold beyond which an ecosystem can no longer maintain its defined features. But once we have defined what collapses, then the whole red list of ecosystem um, category and methodology reflects the probability of reaching that state. Of course, there is a lot of discussion that can uh, uh, be open when discussing about what an ecosystem is. Well, the red list of ecosystem methodology proposed, it's a very, very basic, open and broad definition where um, ecosystem is just a complex of um, biotic elements, abiotic environments, the interaction among all of them, and a physical space that they actually operate and occupy. And of course, because the mechanism of ecosystem collapse are diverse and differ uh, um, enormously among the different types of ecosystems from linear to uh, uh, non-linear with hysteresis, where the reversibility of the collapse it differs amongst um, different um, <coughs> ecosystem types. Um, the <coughs> red list of ecosystem methodology, what it does is reflects about the different uh, mechanisms or the main pathways of collapse and try to assess like a um, um, health um, test conducted in a human person. Um, the most common pathway for collapse, of course, is ecosystem destruction. Um, these, for example, freshwater swamp forests in Bangladesh are being converted into agricultural land um, and are physically disappeared from the landscape. Um, and that's the most obvious pathways of collapse. But some others are a bit less, less obvious, like, for example, um, this freshwater lagoon in, <clears throat> that it's being um, Mm, invaded by an invasive species, and that's changing the entire interaction um, among the systems. And that may also lead to a collapse, but to, a, to a what extent and at what speed, it's something that needs to be um, clarified. Similarly, the abiotic conditions may change and no longer provide um, living conditions for an ecosystem, or even uh, very small ecosystems may, may be subjected 
to very specific threats due to the very restricted range. These <coughs> um, main pathways of collapse have been interacted in a model um, that basically identify, uh, identify the five main pathways of collapse as threatening processes and uses them as criteria to um, establish a logical assessment for the red list of ecosystem. And basically these five criteria are used to assess um, category um, to the ecosystem that are um, a copy of the red list of uh, species. So um, least concern, near threat and vulnerable in danger, critically in danger. So there's a growing um, level of uh, collapse risk according to that categories. And this um, assessment method is used <clears throat> for a variety of um, reasons, but um, the process itself of assessing the ecosystem, it provides a number of outputs that are not just the risk category, but also it helps identifying indicators of change for risk assessment of monitoring, um, it provides very important information for the development and restoration strategies or ecosystem management policies and it um, defines some structures, the data and the evidence in, in a logical frame. Um, so in, in the last um, 13 years, we are seeing an, a growing number of red list assessments being conducted around the world. Mm, it's true that most of them have mostly been done in the terrestrial realm and much less in the marine ecosystems. Um, uh, in some cases, entire countries have been assessed. For example, the case of Colombia that has recently um, finished with the marine part. Um, um, you can access the data in this link. In some particular cases, some um, very specific ecosystems have been identified, uh, assessed uh, <coughs> separately as um, a bottom-up approach um, because they were um, either a, prior, a political priority or because they were there in uh, different regions. So those are the main two um, strategies that have been used so far, either strategic assessment or systematic assessments entire territory or a very specific ecosystem. Um, now in the recent years, um, there, there was a growing concern about the uh, possibility or the potential use of the uh, red list of ecosystems when applied at a global scale. And uh, <coughs> uh, as you can imagine, the number of countries um, to apply a red list of ecosystems globally are being able to add up assessments specific territory um, were very considerable. Um, and probably the most um, uh, challenging uh, element to conduct a global uh, assessment, it was the non-existence or an agreed global typology where all the, the um, regional assessments would rely on and could add up to a common purpose. That's why some years ago, a group of um, uh, scientists got together and started developing um, a global typology that is currently under review and is already um, um, drafted on the web. Um, and it's <coughs> basically a proposal for a hierarchical um, um, classification structure around six level of hierarchy where the first three ones, uh, realms, biome, and functional groups are defined top-down, and then biogeographical ecotypes, ecosystem types, and local ecosystem types are then defined bottom-up. Um, <coughs> the um, distinction in realms, biomes, and um, functional types is basically a structure around three main blocks, terrestrial, freshwater, and marine, um, with the interactions among them. So the interaction between marine and freshwater would be the estuaries and inlets or the de deltas or the seashore between terrestrial and marine and so forth. And this would lead um, finally to the, um, <coughs> the description of um, functional types, uh, functional groups that are 
uh, <coughs> descriptive profiles organized around uh, very basic um, levels that are basically designed for a non-specialist uh, user with simplified explanation on ecological traits, key drivers, distributions, and, um, and the main conceptual framework that it's organized around it. In this example, we can see, for example, the seagrass meadows um, that are organized um, with a basic map of distribution around the world, the conceptual model with the key traits, key drivers, um, and how they interact among them uh, on a basic um, distribution model in a way that um, somebody assessing seagrass meadows in one part of the world may be looking at the same traits and drivers that somebody on the other part of the world and that, that would make them comparable then when going down to specific um, particularities. Um, I don't want to go into more detail, but um, can probably be more illustrative by uh, hearing the explanation from in the coral reefs of West East, uh, um, Island, West Island Ozen, um, on how to use this global typology to be downscaled into ecosystem types. And um, I think you might find his presentation very inspiring. I leave the floor to you, David. Um, Let's stop sharing there. Okay, thank you. Let me um, just set up my slides. Uh, okay, well, thank you, uh, Marcos and Radica, for uh, setting the stage. Um, and thanks to everybody for joining the, the webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So, um, my name is David Obura. I'm a coral biologists and I work at Cordia East Africa. That's my research organization based in Mombasa in Kenya. And I've been working um, on coral reefs in this region and other parts of the world for, uh, for the last 25, 30 years. Um, I also chair the IUCN Coral Specialist Group. Um, so based out of the, the Species Survival Commission. Um, and we're collaborating with, uh, with Radica and Marcos's team uh, on the Red List of Ecosystems. So we've become, Cordia has become a partner uh, to promote this. And we're undertaking this effort to, to do a Red Listing of Ecosystems for the Western Indian Ocean coral reefs. And it's funded by NORAD, a grant that we have from the Norwegian Aid Agency. So what I'll do is, um, unfortunately, I can't tell you the results because we are just right now um, we have finished the analysis and we are finalizing a paper for submission to conservation letters for publication at the same time as we're submitting the re results to the RLE team in IUCN to, um, to verify and, and review the analysis we've done. But I think what's more useful anyway for this group is to go through the methodology and approach that we've taken. Um, and I've put together a number of slides just um, going through a range of the details that, that we've gone through to implement it. Um, and I do this from a couple of perspectives. One is that, um, so we're doing this at the regional level for coral reefs and as Cordio, we're a, we're a Kenyan organization and active in the Western Indian Ocean. We've, we're very engaged in regional coral reef uh, research and conservation and monitoring processes here. Um, but as the Coral Specialist Group, I'm also very interested in how we can apply this same assessment method globally across all coral reef regions. And the data set we've, the, the main data set we've used is the regional data from the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network. We produced uh, a, a report in 2017 and have updated it a couple of times since then. There's a global report coming out this year in a few months. And with that global report, there'll basically be the data structure is in place to assess all coral reefs around the world. So um, both Radica and, and Marcos mentioned the interest in extending uh, this red listing process at a global scale. So I think we can certainly do that for coral reefs coming up. The important thing is that um, a single global analysis probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but consistent regional analyses and then down uh, with eco-regional um, detail make a lot of sense. And I'll hopefully be able to explain some of that as I go through the slides. The second perspective, which may be of interest to 
many people on, on the webinar is that while we're developing this method for coral reefs, of course, uh, there's a lot of complementarity between coral reefs, mangroves and seagrass beds, especially. And I think the methodology can be applied um, and adjusted quite easily to suit those ecosystems. And so the second thing we would be interested in doing is trying to do more sort of multi ecosystem assessments. So do support the uh, the red listing of mangroves and seagrasses uh, and combine those analyses with coral reef and assessments to support management. So uh, I'll step into the into the methodology now. Um, we this map shows the region that we operate in. This is the Western Indian Ocean. It's a UNEP regional seas uh, net, um, region. It's very consistent biogeographically. It's also one of the marine ecoregions of the world provinces uh, from the 2007 uh, system that was established. And it makes a lot of sense to do a coral reef assessment at this level. Uh, what we've also done is to break the region, the province down into its constituent ecoregions. Uh, and there are 11 of them. And I'll explain a little bit about this further on. And this map shows those ecoregions, but I'll come back to that. Um, I think I have a slide. Let's see. How do I? Oh, I have to, sorry, go into PowerPoint to, to move it forward. Uh, one second. Okay, there. So I thought I'd show a couple of, uh, this is my one image of beautiful coral reef photos, um, but also to make the point really that coral reefs are really under pressure around the world. Um, and, and we all know from, from uh, warming um, and climate scenarios and also local pressures on reefs, that they are one of the prime ecosystems globally that is under threat um, and, and uh, really at high risk of collapse. So it's a very strong interest of ours to see how well this approach um, handles that and uh, identifies the level of risk that reefs are facing at the scale that, that we're looking at them. So this slide shows some of the, the, the bleaching impacts that's, that are common uh, in the Western Indian Ocean to the right. But now just on to process slides. So we've been at this for essentially a year and a half functionally. It's taken that long to do it. Uh, could be done a bit faster, but there is quite a process of uh, preparation, data collection, analysis and reporting. We've had two workshops, one in March last year and one in January this year uh, to um, get buy into the project and then to validate our results. And right now we're at the very final stages and we're hopefully done in the next couple of weeks. Our primary outputs will be uh, manuscripts and conservation letters because we believe that the result has very strong policy relevance, particularly with the CBD processes coming up and indicators being identified for the coming years. But that's a very short manuscript. The supplementary material essentially describes the methodology and that's very long. And that will be the main basis of the submission of the RLE to IUCN with the primary results. But we are also preparing the supplementary material so it can be a very strong manual for subsequent applications in other coral reef regions. Uh, so to help guide those processes. Um, I won't go into this slide because Marcos has already explained that. He touched on the, um, the ecosystem typology that has been developed and led by David Keith um, and this has, has just been published. And the top three levels go from the, at the top level, the realm is marine. The shelf ecosystems are the second level and coral reefs are identified at the third level of ecosystem functional group as are mangrove systems and seagrasses uh, and a few other um, of the marine ecosystems we know well. Um, we have used, uh, so the marine ecoregions of the world, um, ecoregions map in the top left. So I did some work on coral biogeography and adapted those a little bit to add more detail for coral reefs. And then Charlie Buren's coral reefs of the world ecoregions also provide a, a good basis for this analysis. We combine these together with some uh, local national work, particularly from Madagascar, um, to identify ecoregions that we felt make sense for this analysis and for which we would have sufficient data to be able to do it. There are these 11 ecoregions um, and the names will come up uh, as we go along. 
it's, it is a matter of discussion. Um, this is more about just a definitional uh, issue for the RLE process is what level the analysis that we have done is at. So level three is the global coral reef distribution. Um, the definition of the RLE units for the eco regions we have applied appears to be around level four um, in, the, in the typology that has been developed. But there are 111 of these Miao eco regions that have coral reefs in them. Um, and so I have questions about whether this province level, the Western Indian Ocean, so region 20, right in the middle of the, the slide there, if that is uh, somewhere between level three and four or should be level four in the typology, it actually doesn't make a huge difference for, um, for implementing um, when you're using data and, and you're using ecological knowledge of the system you're using, but it does make a difference longer term in terms of definitions. So we need to resolve that. A big part of implementing the RLE is to develop a, an ecosystem model for the system uh, that you're assessing. And this is basically an ecosystem model for a coral reef that we have developed for our use. We're focused on the major compartments of the coral, the fleshy algae and fish uh, components and the interactions between those. Um, and then also how they are affected by other um, aspects. Um, you can see the drivers and pressures above, things like bleaching, nutrients and sediments are in there, sea urchins, and then um, physical aspects of the reef system, the spatial aspects at the bottom. In the end, based on the data availability that we had from the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, this is a simpler model that reflects the components that we could analyze in bowls. So corals, uh, coral cover, fleshy algae, um, defined by adding turf and macroalgae together. And then fish abundance in two trophic groups we could use was parrotfish as herbivores and groupers as piscivores. Um, and then we, in terms of threats, we were able to get data to look at uh, sea surface temperature warming uh, from, from model projections. And then also um, the impact of fishing uh, that you can see in the fish populations. We were not able to get good enough data to look at river sediments and coastal development impacts through nutrients and sediments. And also in terms of at the bottom reef rugosity and habitat, uh, spatial aspects of the habitat of connectivity. But we are considering those in the interpretation of the results and, and the criterion B is essentially a spatial criterion um, for um, that does apply uh, down in that part of the, the model. Um, but one thing that we really spent a lot of time on trying to think about, and this is that, so an ecosystem like a coral reef is a very complex system with many cascading interactions, some very strong ones, some weaker ones, and really cor hard corals are the uh, engineers of the coral reef. So typically the RLE, just like the red list of species as well, takes the highest threat level. You, you may look at multiple compartments in a system, but the system that has the highest threat level, so up to vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered, would be the one that gets assigned uh, to the overall threat assessment. Um, but we felt that with the interactions uh, in coral reefs, so if I just go back to this slide, so if the coral is in very good shape and the flower the fleshy algae is in very good shape and perhaps a parrotfish, uh, there's, they're very abundant. If you do have a decline in grouper abundances because of fishing and groupers are very overfished, is that, is that sufficiently uh, strong enough reason to classify the whole ecosystem? If the groupers you can classify as critically endangered because of fishing, can you classify the whole reef system as critically endangered? And so this is a big part of the paper that we're submitting to, to get, um, uh, I guess, a sense of the scientific community on this. And the collapse model that we developed is more of a structured model where you first take the hard coral condition um, and then the primary interaction in a coral reef on the benthos for the corals at least is between competition between hard coral and fleshy algae. So if the threat status of fleshy algae is higher than that as we found for corals, then we would step up the threat level of the coral one step. 
And then the parrotfish are very important for mediating the interaction between hard corals and fleshy algae. So if their threat level was, a, was higher than the combined level we got for hard corals and fleshy algae together, then again, we would step up the threat level and so on to groupers. And the effect of this is that if you have all the compartments are at a relatively high threat level, um, you do step up to a, um, to a high threat level for the ecosystem. But if just one of them is, is very um, impacted, uh, the groupers or parrotfish because of fishing or fleshy algae because of something else, but the other compartments are not at such a high threat level, then you wouldn't necessarily um, assign such a high threat level to the whole ecosystem. So this is an area that, that really is, is open for, for debate and, and consideration. And then it's quite a complex process of going through, there are, there are five criteria which go down the left side of this table. I won't go into this table in, in great detail, but to apply the red list of ecosystems, you do have to look at um, each of these criteria and can you, can you assess it with the data you have at hand? So A looks at the, the overall ecosystem extent. So in our case, the coral reef area and how has that changed um, over, um, you can look at change in the past, uh, a combination of recent years and some future projections and you can look at the future as well. Uh, and can you estimate decline in the area of the ecosystem over time? B really focuses on small geographic distributions. So very small ecoregions or small reef units that you, uh, coral reef areas you can assess. And then criteria C and D really apply that the model that I just shown. C looks at uh, environmental variables that could undermine um, the reef system. And for this, we were able to analyze sea surface temperature into the future um, because there are very good SST projections into the future. We were not able to assess historical temperatures because the, the data sets don't go back 50 years well enough. And then for D looks at biotic disruption or the reef condition. And so looking over to the right, you can see this is where we use the estimates of coral cover, algae to coral ratio as a, a measure of algal importance and then parrotfish and group abundance. And we had to the right hand column for each of these variables, you have to assign from the literature and from your knowledge of the system, what the collapse threshold is. Um, and so we went through that. I won't go into the details here unless there's some questions about it. And that's a major part of the publication as well as to justify those. And then E is a quantitative model. So combining all of the above, if you have a quantitative model uh, of an ecosystem, uh, can you evaluate that? And we didn't have one, so we could not evaluate criteria E, but we were able to evaluate A, B, C, and D uh, for our coral reef systems. This just shows a, a quick map um, of, of the, these are 10 of the ecoregions for which we had monitoring data from the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network. And the dots show the points um, where we had valid data in each of those ecoregions. And I think it varied from about, I think the minimum was 14 sites in an ecoregion and the maximum was about 120 or 130 sites in that ecoregion to, to assess uh, criterion A and D in the end. Uh, so there is very variable data uh, availability for coral reef areas, and you have to deal with that. One of the ecoregions didn't have any monitoring data for coral reefs, so it couldn't be assessed for, for those criteria. Um, just a quick statement. I won't go into the detail of this. For criterion D, um, there is quite a... Uh, I, it is complex to explain relative severity calculations. So the key thing about the RLE approach is it's not so much a site-based approach to looking at the risk of collapse, but you take an area, in our case, an ecoregion, and you have to consider the amount of decline uh, from initial conditions compared to the current value, and then also compared to the collapse, the threshold for collapse to your sign. And that's, uh, there's the equation here gives you an index of the relative severity and that can extend from zero up to a hundred basically with a hundred being uh, you know, complete uh, collapse. But you not only assess how the severity of decline, but how much of the ecoregion, what proportion of the extent of the e ecoregion um, receives that amount of decline. So in red at the bottom, 
I just give an example there. So if 50% of all, so I calculated a relative severity of 40%, there you can see in the middle. So you look across the table, that's greater than 30% severity. And then you look down the rows to the extent affected by that amount of decline. So 40%, if this occurred at 50% of sites, then it doesn't actually, the, the, the blue star, it doesn't actually um, trigger a criterion for collapse. But if there was 85% of the sites were experiencing 40% uh, severity of decline, then we would classify um, that, that unit as vulnerable uh, to collapse. So um, you need, it takes quite a lot of calculations. We've actually set up uh, our code uh, for analysis. For, it will work for coral reefs um, for different types of data sets uh, to be able to calculate uh, these severities of collapse. And then I just showed an, um, another challenge that we had was, um, so I won't go into this in detail. I, I wasn't quite sure how much quantitative detail to go into in the presentation, but a challenge that we had, which will be the same for many looking at marine systems is that of course we do have recent data and um, based on the data sets we have we use 2013 to 2019 um, data points as uh, to get an estimate of the recent condition for coral algae and fish the RLE requires you to look over a 50-year time period to look at the degree of collapse of the ecosystem over 50 year period. So we then had to, to go back to 1970 to compare to conditions today. Now they're not, they're very, there are no data streams in our region that go back to 1970, but there are some data streams to the mid eighties. And there's, we know that the biggest sort of um, events causing decline in our reefs was the 1998 bleaching event. So we had to make certain assumptions and used some early estimates of coral cover in this case to project back to 1970. And then because these were estimates, we used a bootstrapping technique. So uh, just through multiple iterations, in the end we chose, we, we determined 750 was enough to get stable results to compare uh, sort of these initial coral cover. So we had a mean and a standard deviation. So use those to sample from a, uh, a random sample from a distribution without mean and standard deviation for initial coral cover to compare to current coral cover for all the sites that we have current coral cover for. So it's quite a complex process again, um, but it's, it's very, um, in the end, it's, it's relatively easy to step through. And we made sure that the results were stable. So this is just some graphs showing the stability of those calculations over up to from zero to a thousand iterations. And we, based on these graphs, we decided to use 750 iterations because all of the lines essentially stabilize at that point. And the, the y-axis there is the percentage of iterations that give a threatened category for each of the ecoregions for each of the variables that we used. So it's quite a robust analysis. And of course, it take, it's taken quite a bit of time to go through all of that. So I'll just finish with this slide, just back to some of the realities. So what we have in terms of our output is each of these colored ecoregions has a level of risk that's been assigned to it uh, for each of the criteria, A, B, C, and D, and then an overall risk level, the highest risk level across those A, B, C, or D. So that's 11 ecoregions with those assessments. And that might, and, and I'll, we'll say that for all the ecoregions, we ended up with an overall assessment between vulnerable and critically endangered uh, for this region. And then we also have an assessment for the province as a whole, uh, just taken as one unit uh, to estimate the, the risk of collapse for, for the province. So that's the result that we have. Um, we have a process, we'll publish that of course, then we have a process of taking those ecoregion results down to national levels over the next couple of years in Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique under the grant that we have um, so that we can try and use the data, the higher resolution for management and to inform policy in those countries. But then as I said at the beginning, we also want to then apply the same methodology and the model and the collapse sort of hypothesis that we've made to other coral reef regions around the world to to, to eventually have a full coverage of coral reefs and then to extend this approach to mangroves and seagrasses. So I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, David.
Um, should we move to question and answer now, or were, was there any additional uh, presentation? Uh, no, I think we're good. We can we can open up for questions. Uh, we've been trying to answer some. There's a lot online. Yes. Uh, yes, we appreciate that. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, and this was a great presentation, Radhika and, and Marcos and David. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know you can send in questions through the chat or the Q&A panel, uh, and um, I'll, I'll ask them out loud to the speakers. Um, so great. So we, we, I posted a bunch in the chat um, of questions that were asked and, and already answered. Um, and if anybody has any follow-up for those, go ahead and, and submit those as well. And we also have some additional questions. Um, there's a question, is there a specific type of ecosystem model that is needed for this, or is that realm dependent? I think that, that was a question specific uh, while David, you were um, Yes, that, was, that came thank up during you. David's presentation. That's correct. Um, so I think Marcos can answer this more in general terms. I mean, that there is an approach, um, um, a model type that is recommended in terms of these uh, stocks and flows. I'm not sure if I can get back to mine easily over here. Um, but, um, but then for each ecosystem, you, you do have to build it up based on you know, the, what, what's available for that e ecosystem. And if there are existing models, uh, that are well established and well accepted, then of course using those as a foundation is, is important. So we used uh, Cori for resilience, uh, a lot of the, the science on resilience as, as, as the foundation for building this one up. But perhaps Marcos, you, you, you might have a more general uh, response on that. Yeah, um, uh, that, that's totally correct. So there is a general um, <clears throat> um, um, already prepared conceptual models for the functional types that are already prepared and the, you have the link on the, um, on the chat. Um, but the objective of those models are not at all rigid, are more inspiring so that you can, you, there might be some of the um, trends or drivers that you have not considered and that the most common um, drivers and um, pressures that uh, are usually affecting that type of functional unit. But then you need to adapt, of course, to the particular ecosystem that you're gonna be assessing. So, um, yeah, uh, adapting it's the answer. Yeah. Thank um, so the other question uh, that came up is, do you use the concept of ecosystem services to assess the health of ecosystems at risk? Um, so the answer for that is no. Um, ecosystem services being more of a human perception or the benefits that ecosystems provide to humans um, are not one of the inputs for the red list of ecosystems. Then both a red list of ecosystem or a risk assessment and an ecosystem services assessment, both together can inform priorities. Um, and that's my understanding, but maybe you Radhika can complement this or correct if I said something incorrect. Yeah, no, my understanding also is the same, and and the fact that you know it's it's both about composition uh, and the functionality aspects, um, to uh, which lead to ecosystem services. But it's not exactly using. We're not there yet. One of the suggestions or discussions right now is how do we actually build in components where then you look at the ecosystem services parts and even do valuations coming uh, economic valuations coming out of, uh, of the red list of ecosystem assessments. How can RLE feed into ecosystem service assessments? No, we're not there yet. Yeah, what I'd say on that is that, so we're of course very interested in that. And, and one of the key things for making this useful in countries as well is, is going down to um, a more detailed sort of site or area-based uh, assessment that at a higher level of detail. And then part of that would be to link this ecosystem model to more of an ecosystem service model about so what, what amount of fishing would be possible, what kind of coastal development or coastal protection is provided by reefs at different levels of risk, and what would that mean for, 
for actions that you might take. So I think this analysis can can then move into that, but yeah, it's not it's not part of the assessment framework at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, and we had a question. I think this is directed to David specifically. Um, was, this is great. This was at the end of your presentation. I think the integrated watershed approach is critical. What are the major data limitations on sediment and nutrient data? Yeah, so we, we considered those. Um, one challenge we had was that we're doing a regional analysis. And so at the regional level, particularly in a region like ours, there's, there's almost no um, in situ data that's consistent on sediments or nutrients or um, chlorophyll. So you can use satellite data, but that record only goes back 20 to 25 years, whereas we need a 50 year time period to be able to do that over here. So, so that, is, that is a big challenge. And one we'll try and address as we go down to a smaller scale within countries, what kind of data sets could we add to the ones that we have now to, to bring in that watershed uh, aspect. So we we'll look into that, but I don't, I don't have the answers to that yet. Okay, thank you, David. Um, another question. So if the red list of ecosystems uses existing and available data to fit into the existing framework, would it not be sub subject to some bias in data scientist perceptions, as one may inadvertently leave out some important factors only because they are data deficient or limited, thus causing different groups to have different perceptions, as happened with the downgrading of the snow leopard's threat category uh, with the red listing of species? Um, yeah, so I, I can take on that specifically for what we have done. So what what this has shown us very clearly, and if I go back to, I guess this this map is it shows very clearly what, what locations are data deficient for one. So and two, what variables and and data are, are missing. So in moving into national level assessments, we would have quite different. Um, you know, recommendations for moving forward, for example, for some of the ecoregions around Madagascar, where there are large gaps in the data, compared to, say, Kenya or, or Mayotte and the Comoros, which have a higher density of, of points for the coastline that's there. So yes, they're very vulnerable to data availability and bias, but the data deficient category and also the category of not evaluating, if you decide that you just don't have the data to be able to address a particular criterion, those, those um, categories do point out those gaps, then you can use those to act on them. Okay, thank you, David. Did you want to add anything, Radhika or Marcos? Uh, no, nothing from my site, thanks. Okay. Okay, no, no. okay. Um, a question, are coral reefs in the Caribbean being assessed using the red list? Um, so Caribbean coreys were assessed, actually the first region to be assessed. So a paper in 2013, essentially looking at application of the RLE uh, approach to, I think it's 17 different ecosystems, mostly terrestrial, but some marine as well, and Caribbean coreys were one of those. So the Caribbeans were assessed and were assessed as being, I think, endangered to critical um, in that paper. And that was based on information from the literature that was pulled together, which is distinct from what we've done here, which is which is getting to the primary monitoring data uh, to do the assessment. So one of the regions where, of course, we would like to extend this to is the Caribbean to update that with, with real data. Okay, thank you. Um, just to follow up on that sort of a more expansive question, um, is there any list of what's been assessed yet and uh, does it include ecosystems in OECD countries such as the Great Barrier Reef in the Gulf of Mexico, high seas and deep seabed included in the initiative? And um, another big picture question, uh, how will this list be used in actual national planning and management processes? Sorry, what was the first question? Well, the first was the list of what has been assessed to date, what ecosystems to date, and will any OECD countries, um, uh, well, country ecosystems, uh, such as the Great Barrier Reef in the Gulf of Mexico be uh, assessed? And then sort of following up on that, uh, what about poles, high seas, and deep seabed? So, so maybe I can take the first part of that. So this is the whole outreach and, and sharing this information because 
um, IUCN and, and colleagues like David, we can't do all the assessments ourselves. The idea is to, to create a network of hourly assessors, people who we can work with, very similar to the red listing of species and, and even KBAs. Um, but the assessments that have been done so far, we're hoping to bring the database for that online. So the red list of ecosystems database. We have a prototype and uh, we've been piloting it and we hope to make it public very, very soon. So there you'll find all the ecosystems that have been assessed. Uh, I'm not sure, Marcos, if we've done anything with the Gulf of Mexico, but the, the whole outreach is to be able to do more assessments together. Okay, well, that was a perfect opportunity for that question then. Um, so thank you, Radhika. If I, uh, if I could add please. to that, um, Sarah. Just so from, my, from what I have been able to find, I think for marine systems, there's been very little that has been assessed. So the, the Caribbean was assessed in 2013. The Mesoamerican Barrier Reef was assessed using a model, a paper in 2017 by um, uh, Bland et al. And then this is ours is the, the next one for coral reefs. And I haven't found other, whether it's uh, mangrove or, or seagrass or tropical marine assessments and certainly not deep sea or open ocean. Uh, so, so it's wide open. Okay, great. Well, then there's lots of opportunities. And um, is, do you guys have a slide with contact information? Uh, if anyone is interested in following up uh, to talk to you about doing assessments and working with you on that, uh, how, how they would best touch. Yeah, I forgot that. I'll, I'll, I'll put one up. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, then, uh, uh, well uh, we'll go to another question. Um, let's see. Um, how, how can or has the list been used in any uh, national planning or management processes? Any past, current, or future? The, how, how has it been used in national planning? So there is a very interesting paper, I'll try to find it now and, and put in the link um, by, um, on the application on Red List of Ecosystems. Um, that explores how this has been used in the different countries. Um, um, in <clears throat> the most interesting ones might be the ones who have already changed the legislation to incorporate the results from the red list of ecosystem processes. Australia has already done that. Um, Finland, uh, it's in the process of uh, using the results of the red list of ecosystems also. And uh, I think Colombia wants to use the results for the expansion of the protected areas, if I'm not incorrect. Um, so yes, there is different uses on that. I searched the link to the paper who explore exactly this um, systematically across the globe, analyzing um, how the results of red list of ecosystem have been used in each country. Um, I be the best way. I don't know if you want to compliment um, Radhika or David um, this one. Um, yeah, thanks, Marco. So what I would say for that is that, um, at least in our case, sorry, because you know we haven't really used them in that way in, cor in coral reef environments, but we do have the grant that we have basically was planned around doing this regional assessment and then moving into national implementations uh, for the next three years. So we have three countries, Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique. And what we'll be doing with those countries is looking at um, what policy processes are ongoing, what instruments would be most useful within the country to, in a way, domesticate this analysis, apply it at a, at a much higher resolution to try and form, uh, you know, protected area planning, um, new areas, fisheries management, restoration, and things like that. So we'll be exploring that uh, in the next three years. Okay, thank you all. Uh, and that's great, David. Thank you for posting the uh, email addresses. So uh, I would encourage anyone who is interested in, in following up on this to uh, get in touch with, with David and Radhika and Marcos uh, using their email. It's posted. Um, there's a question about um, doing a global red list uh, implementation. Um, and so wouldn't that be challenging given that other global maps uh, sort of have been um, Receive criticism of, of being too broad scale um, to be useful. So I sort of just discuss the utility and, and sort of what the nature of, of a global assessment. 
Yeah, so I can take that on more practically for coral reefs. So, of course, I have wondered about that. And I, so I don't think it's useful or practical to do a, a single global coral reef assessment and get one um, level of risk, vulnerable, uh, endangered, critically endangered for coral reefs worldwide. I think there's too much variation. Uh, the Caribbean is a system, separate system from the Indo-Pacific. Um, and it's not very helpful for what you do with that information. Um, and that's partly what the ecosystem typology has been developed for, is to help identify what is the global extent of a particular uh, class or type of, of that ecosystem. So coral reefs down to a biogeographic level. Um, so, it, so in our, in practical terms, I found that even at the regional level for the uh, Western Indian Ocean, I'm not so sure that result is that useful, except for comparing amongst the 12 or 15 uh, different um, or 30 different regions there are and helping to prioritize working in one part of the Pacific rather than another at a regional scale. But I think it's much more useful when you get down to the eco-regional level and then, you know, so especially where countries have multiple eco-regions within them, that you can really get to, uh, to analyses that can really influence policy and, and implementation decisions and action on the ground. So I think there is a there is a midpoint where it makes a lot of sense to apply the approach, and that will have to that will take a, a number of years and different uh, ecosystems, I think, to to work that out precisely what you get from doing the assessment at different scales. Okay, thank and you, David. If I, sorry, Sarah. If I sure. can add, I think the the idea of this global assessment has really come from mirroring the red list of species, where you know um, it's more of a political visibility and trying to get joint action to happen saying globally tigers are um, this level of risk etc but it's true then you're translating it into action you would need to go back to more specific uh, regional sub-regional national types so it's more of a trying to get a political tool or or visibility in place um, and and the two global assessments that are almost complete are mangroves and mud flats which are two of the very highly vulnerable uh, ecosystem types and then um, there's been a lot of you know unexpected reactions for for example for the mud flats um, there are uh, there is um, navy in different country interested in the data set because they w would like to know whether uh, whether rocky shores etc are so it's 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 not that that is the one approach it's one of the aspirations of of trying to mirror the sister product, which is the red list of species, and hoping that the ecosystem level momentum picks up with that uh, as much as it has with the species assessment. Yeah, if, if I can add to that too. So I think there's a huge amount of value in, in covering the global extent of the system. So undertaking the red list of ecosystems across all coral reef regions worldwide would be very useful because then we'd have a, a standard metric, uh, one amongst a few that could help to identify what the uh, uh, priorities are uh, around the world. And then reassessing on a regular basis, I think would be very useful. The, the new CBD uh, targets and monitoring framework has a red list of ecosystems cropping up as one of the key metrics as well. So I think it's extremely useful to cover the global extent of an ecosystem, but the scale at which each sort of assessment is done, um, I think um, a, a lower than global scale is probably more useful for prioritizing actions. Okay, thank you all. Um, I was just going to relay one uh, comment that came up um, in the questions, and that uh, Alberto Acosta wanted to let folks know that in Colombia uh, they are doing assessments of coral, mangroves, and seagrass for the Pacific and the Caribbean. Um, and I will, we weren't able to get quite all the questions, but I will be providing those to you, um, Radhika, Marcos, and David, um, so that you can see them. And um, the email addresses are available right now in, in the chat if anybody uh, needed them to get in touch. But uh, thank you so much for being here today. We have wanted to, uh, to have a, a, a webinar on this for quite some time, and it was very fortuitous that we were able to uh, finally uh, get it to get, meet up and, and get this together. So we really appreciate uh, you being willing to do this. Uh, and we appreciate everyone who was able to attend today. Uh, so I just uh, thank you guys again and we'll uh, say, wish everyone a good evening and a good rest of your day.
Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone.